Uh, Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 35. We'll just read a few verses. Very familiar to you. The Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm going to pray and then I want to preach on this subject. Help wanted. Help wanted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I sure... I sure enjoy the decorations and the activities and the skits and the songs. Lord, I sure am glad everybody's here. Thank you for safety, for everybody getting here. Thank you for them coming. Lord, they didn't have to come. They chose to. It means a lot. But Lord, it, it doesn't mean anything if you don't show up. Lord, I pray you'd fill me with your power as I preach. Please don't just let me say a few words for a few minutes. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to hearts. Lord, if I read this right, Lord, you're, you're asking for us to, to help you pray for somebody to get involved. Lord God, I pray that I can convey this truth to the young people that are here today. As I speak to their ears, you speak to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Up to this point in the Bible, it has been Jesus' ministry. The disciples have sat on the sideline and other than the occasional uh, you do this and you do that, Jesus has done the work. But here in Matthew chapter number 9, Jesus is preparing them. He is getting ready to pass on the ministry. Now in verse number 35, it, it details what Jesus' ministry was. The Bible says that He went, he went into, about into all the cities, teaching in their synagogues. Uh, that's like church. Uh, uh, he, uh, the, the Bible says He preached the gospel. Uh, uh, and uh, the Bible says then uh, the gospel of the kingdom. And He healed every sickness. So basically Jesus did something some church, uh, he, he did some discipleship, and he did some soul winning. Amen? And so uh, he did that, in, in, and, and, he, and he did some one-on-one uh, some, uh, -on -one, uh, work. Uh, uh, you can call that discipleship. You can call that helping people, whatever you want to call it. Uh, sometimes it's uh, opening the Bible with them and, and teaching them uh, uh, what the Bible says about alcohol. Sometimes it's uh, buying them groceries, all right? And if you've been in the ministry any bit of time, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's moving furniture and... Uh, and even more crazy stories that all everybody could tell. But, uh, but that's what Jesus was doing here in the Bible. And, and, and he's telling the disciples, or that, that verse is telling what his ministry was. And he's getting ready to pass that, that ministry on to the disciples. Verse 36, as he's preparing them, the Bible says he sees a multitude, or he looks over a multitude, and Jesus is moved with compassion. Now many times when we hear this passage preached, we focus on the movement of Jesus. He was moved with compassion. And we focus on the fact He was moved because of the physical needs of the people. Now the Bible does say they were fainted. The Bible does say they were scattered abroad. And, and I believe Jesus was moved with their physical needs. But Jesus was deeply moved by their spiritual needs as well. They needed saved. They needed disciples. They needed discipled. They needed a real relationship with God. And they had, I believe Jesus was just as, he was just as moved with compassion for these people. Not just because they were scattered and not just because they were faint. But if you read this passage, I believe that Jesus was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no one helping them. You said, Brother Davis, how do you know that or why do you think that? Because in the very next verse, Jesus makes the two legendary statements that we've heard hundreds of sermons on. The harvest truly is plenteous, meaning, hey, yeah, they got a lot of needs and a lot of problems that we need to work on. But then he says, 
the laborers are few. And I believe it was not just one of those things that moved Jesus with compassion. I believe it was both of those things that moved Jesus with compassion. I don't believe it was just the needs of the people. I believe it was the fact that there was no one helping or leading or captaining those people as a shepherd does his sheep as Jesus uses that illustration here in the Bible. They were faint, that means weak or depressed or dispirited. They were scattered, unstable, no unity, untrusting. Yet they were in a multitude. There were many of them in this condition. Why were they like that? There was no shepherd, no helper, no guide, no worker. We often hear teaching and preaching on the compassion for the multitude. But I got news for you. Jesus had compassion. He was moved with compassion on the fact that there was no man. Where was the leader? Where was the helper? Where was the servant to serve the multitude? Who was going to help that multitude? And I believe both of those things move Jesus with compassion. Jesus then moves on from the illustration of the sheep to the illustration of, of a farmer. And, and the Bible says in, in verse number 37 in those two landmark statements that He makes, He, he says that the harvest truly is plenteous. That's point number one. Uh, the, the Bible says the harvest truly is plenteous. He tells us there that there is a lot of work to do. The word plenteous means big. It means big. There's a lot. There's an abundance. There was a multitude. By the way, there still is a multitude. Right around seven billion. There's a lot in your state. I don't know how it is in your state. I think we're uh, uh, just over 4 million. And uh, I don't know how it is in your city. We're upwards of 300,000. I don't know how it is in your church. I don't know how it is in your family. Here's what I know. Four babies are born every second. Now if you go out there and stand in the corner, you'll think it's a lot more every second. Four are born every second. Multitude. Plenteous. Hey, listen, it shouldn't take you very long at all when you, when you get on social media or you turn on the television or whatever your uh, uh, entertainment venue is to get a burden for that, that the harvest is plenteous. Four more. Four more. Four more. It's big. It's big. There's a lot of them. It also means that it's ready. The Bible says in John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Not only does it mean that they're big, but the crop is ready. You say, oh, I knocked doors all day Saturday and nobody got saved. Then you, you might have just been uh, planting seed. You don't always reap. But there's a field somewhere that's ready to reap right now because he said that not only, not only are there, uh, is there a lot of them, but they're ready. That crop has to be harvested soon or it'll ruin. I told the workers this morning we grew a little box garden in the backyard and, and uh, uh, we grew tomatoes and you had to get those tomatoes off because if you didn't, what happened? They rotted. And you know what happens? If we don't work in the harvest, they rot. In hell. In hell. It's still real. That's where they go if they don't get saved. Let that compassion set in for you. Move, move on that compassion. The harvest is plenteous. Not only is uh, the harvest is plenteous uh, uh, spiritually. Listen, death is coming to all of us. There's, a, there's an appointment you have to keep, Hebrews chapter 9. Two people die every second. Some of you know that more than others because you've experienced it in your own family. Here's the thing about that. We don't know who. Picture on my memories from today. From today, five year, four years ago, five years ago, 
All my teens here. One of them in heaven now. You don't know. The harvest is plenteous. It shouldn't take you long to get a burden for the harvest. Not only is the harvest plenteous spiritually, the harvest is plenteous sinfully. Uh, in our state, uh, uh, it, there, are, there are young people that overdose every day on drugs. Where I come from, preacher mentioned it. We, uh, my home church is here. Uh, uh, that part of the, the state, not just my that city, but uh, th- that entire region is is uh, riddled with drug use. And you're you're the part where you come from of the country may be the same way. People die every day because they're using drugs because they're lacing drugs with elephant tranquilizers, and they die. And we want to go make money. Teens are killing teenagers over Facebook and Fortnite. When you said something mean about me on Facebook, someone come over your house and stab you. I'm, I'm not making that up. Babies are born to teenagers and they give them to their grandmothers to raise. Dr. Jorgensen hit on it, but teenagers are more and more turning to the homosexual and the lesbian lifestyle. You all that work bus routes, you know what I'm talking about. You knock on those doors every week. Not only is the harvest plenty of sinfully, it's, the harvest is, uh, is plenty of statistically. Seven billion people, it's estimated that 20% have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. 20%. Now listen, are we wasting our time here? Because they, they got a leadership conference across, across town. 20% of the world has never heard. Thousands don't have a Bible in their language. And I think it's God's will for me to be a beautician. The harvest is plenteous. Number two, the laborers are few. Jesus was moved with compassion. Not just because of their need, but because there was no one helping that need. The word few means not many or small in number. With a plenteous harvest, you would think there would be a bunch of workers. Now notice he didn't say there were a few teenagers. Because there's not. Notice he didn't say there were a few youth groups. There's not. Hey, he didn't say there were a few preachers or a few churches or a few Bible colleges or a few athletes or a few pretty boys or a few mama's boys or a few princesses or a few floozies or a few separated Christians, a few Pharisees or a few Christian school students or a few homeschool students or a few public school students or a few students that dropped out of school. He didn't say there were a few musically talented or a few academically talented or a few spiritually talented or a few no talented. He said the laborers were few he said the harvest is plenteous he didn't say the preacher boys were few they are but he didn't say that he didn't say the nursing majors were few he didn't say the missionaries were few he didn't say the teachers were few he didn't say the good grades were few he didn't say the first responders were few or the military were few or the lawyers were few or the leaders of the class were few or the captains of the bus were few or the bosses of the house were few he said the laborers were few these broken fainted hurting people needed laborers workers Helpers, servants. How many of your youth group that came last year didn't come this year? 
the laborers are few. How many of you go to a church, go to your church, but do nothing at your church? Let's just be real with each other. You go, you sit, you listen, you leave. The attenders are not few. The laborers are few. Y'all, those of you that drove here, how many of you helped unload the bags? How many of you helped carry the bags? The laborers are few. Oh, right, you thought I was going to beg you to be a preacher, right? That's why you shut me off when I got up here. Because that's what you're so used to hearing. Jesus didn't say the preachers were few. He said the laborers were few. Now you give me a man that will surrender to be a laborer. And God can make him a great preacher. But you take a guy and all he wants to do is be a preacher. But he ain't willing to be a laborer. He ain't going to be much of a preacher. If you won't carry a table across a room, you ain't going to carry the gospel across the world. Let me say that again so you college students in the back can hear me, okay? If you won't carry a table across a room, you ain't going to carry the gospel across the world. You want to do something for God, start by carrying some chairs. Start by running a vacuum cleaner. Start by cleaning some toilets. Start by asking your pastor or your youth pastor, hey, what can I do to help at the church? When I was in college, Brother C used to call it being a church rat. Maybe a lot of churches have rats, I don't know. I had bats once when I was a pastor, but never rats. Start there. There are 4,000 4, to 7,000 churches that close each year. Listen, you say, uh, do you want me to be a preacher? I, listen, that's between you and God. But you know what you could be first? A laborer. You know where God picks His best preachers from? The laboring. The laborers. The laborers. Laborers. Does your church have a bus ministry? Do you work in it? Why not? Oh, because when preacher makes the announcement, he just says, we had 200, 300, 400 on buses or 50 on buses. He don't say, man, I'm real proud of this kid. Right. Right. That's why. That's why. Or because you're just a worker. I mean, you would, you would work in the bus ministry if you was a captain. Or if you were the director. Because, I mean, you got all the good ideas. Your church do nursing home service? Oh, you're going you're gonna to be a pastor. But you won't preach to a bunch of old people that can't move? That's a captive audience, man. In fact, that's a lot like pastoring, if I remember right. It's a lot like youth pastoring sometimes. You guys just you stand there and just sit there and don't move. Does the church have an addictions ministry? They have a choir? They have a nursery? You want to humble yourself? Go change some diapers. Who cleans the church? Do you think those little papers that you put in the back of the pew just magically disappear? Like the leprechaun from the Lucky Charms box just walks in when church is over and picks up all the trash? You ever just think to volunteer? 
Well, I ain't called. That's what we like to say. Well, I ain't called to preach. Well, I ain't called to be a missionary. Well, I ain't called to do this. And I ain't called to do that. Hey, listen, answer your phone because I'm calling right now. God's calling right now. He said, the harvest is plenteous. But we ain't got nobody to work. Who carries tables for your church events? Who mows your church grass? You say, well, brother so-and-so, he gets paid. Right, because we live for money. I forgot about that. That's why we want to be an engineer or a doctor or a dentist so we can stick our hands in people's mouths because we love their mouth and their teeth and their nasty breath and their tongue and looking down their nose at what's in their nose. Not because we want to make money. See, the laborers are few. We want to play sports. We want to, we want to sing if we can win a trophy. We need more ladies like those ladies that sat out there and checked you guys in. We spent countless hours out here at 1 o'clock in the morning. Who went through that chart and marked your seats? So you'd know where to sit. You'll never see them. But the, they knew the harvest was plenteous. And they were willing to be laborers. We need more ladies like the ladies that are cleaning, preparing your food, running registration. We need more men like the men that worked at decoration. Almost, once again, long nights, no pay, made calls, emails, running the games, doing the activities today. We want applauded in church and our name and lights. And Meanwhile, Jesus looks at the multitude and says, and I'm broken hearted, number one, because those people are hurt, and number two, nobody even cares. But you enjoy your video games. Enjoy the, the, new, the new Marvel movie. Enjoy sleeping in on Saturday. Selfishness and laziness. While Jesus is moved with compassion. So you're trying to make us feel bad, Brother Davis? I'm just preaching the Bible. Amen. Number one, the harvest is plenteous. Number two, the laborers are few and there's help wanted. Number three, one request. Okay, this is where he asks us to be preachers. Nope. Verse 38. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest. He says, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, Hey, fellas, I want you to do something for me. Look at all these people. They're fainting. They're scattered. There's nobody to help them. Look at the lost world. They need your help. Look at your youth group. They need your help. Look at your church. It needs your help. Look at your city. Look at your state. Look at the towns you'll pass on your way home that may or may not have a church. The town you stop in to eat and the people you talk to wonder as you talk to them, you ought to think, I wonder if there's a church in this town that witnesses to them when we're not stopping here. Jesus says to them though, he says, Look, listen fellas, will you all just help me pray? Will you just help me pray? Will you all that are here this morning just help me pray? that there are more laborers for the harvest. More servants that are willing to serve in their church.
that'll go soul winning, that'll, that'll prepare uh, for meetings, that'll carry tables, that'll do, that, that'll do what needs to be done in a church that nobody ever sees. And, and, and beyond that, uh, yes, more preachers, and yes, more missionaries, and yes, more, uh, 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 more, more uh, sold out, surrendered young people. Yes, that. But most of all, just servants. Willing, yielded servants. That'll do anything God asks. Will you just help me pray? Will you? That's all I'm asking. That's all Jesus asked. He asked him, he said, Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. My grandpa, and I've heard my preacher say this, the best place to pray for a good garden is at the end of a hoe handle. Apparently the best place to pray for laborers is at the end of a good hoe handle too because let me tell you what happens when these people pray. Look at Matthew 10. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples... He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He names the twelve. Then skip down to verse 7 and 8. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. He then gives them a commission and sends them. Now somewhere between the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, I assume they prayed. But as they prayed, God said, Why not you? Now I don't know if He would do that to you or not, but He did that to them. That's sort of how it worked. Jesus told Peter, follow me. He surrendered and then he said, I'll make you fishers of men. He became a laborer. Paul got knocked off the horse. First thing he said was, Lord, he surrendered. What would thou have me do? He became a laborer. This was before he said Paul an apostle and Paul of this and Paul of that and Paul of that. The first thing he said was, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything. I'll do anything. It wasn't about where to be a missionary or if to be a missionary or who to marry or where to go to college. It was this. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. In fact, it was this. I'll do it. It doesn't matter what it is. Where can I serve? What can I do? There's a need. I'll tell you one story and then I'll close. There was a man, preacher was preaching one time and there was an older man, he came to the altar and he began to pray for young men to surrender to start churches in Kentucky. He was begging God on the altar and he was saying, Lord, would you please call young men to start churches in Kentucky? We need churches. And as he was praying, God said, there's a man right here. And as he tells the story, he said to God, no, 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 not me. I mean, I was praying for young men, not me. I was praying for other people. And him and God finished that conversation, and when he got up, he went and started a church that's been there for 17 years now. 17 years. All because he said, I'll pray for laborers. And he became one. Will you pray for some laborers? You may be here and you've said this. Maybe you've made this statement. Brother Davis, I'm just not called to ministry or I'm not called to preach or I, I just don't feel like uh, I, 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 I'm not uh, called to go to Bible college. But listen, have you ever said to God, I'll do whatever you want me to do? Or do you hand him a list of things you won't do and then say, okay, God, I'm willing to do your will. Oh, I think this is your will because here's the 17 million things I won't do. Will you approve this one? 
What Have you ever just said to God, I'll do whatever you want me to do? Or do we tell God, yeah, I'm not called to do this, and I'm not called to do that, and I'm not called to do that because we decided. Have we ever said, God, if you wanted me to, I would. I'm open. I'm surrendered. I just want to serve. I just want to reach the harvest. 